Hi, I'm Zach Childs, and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today, our guest is John Jorgensen. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you for coming down for the show. My pleasure. My pleasure. I always like talking about guitars and music, so good. Well, it ought to be easy. Yes, definitely. <laughs> well, you were born in Madison, Wisconsin. I was. Uh, my, my parents are both from Wisconsin. My dad's from Stoughton, and my mom's from East Troy. And when I was about a year old, they met in music school. My okay. mom was a piano major and my dad was a composition major, but then got a teaching credential because my mom said she wasn't going to be married to a struggling composer. Oh. So, <laughs> so he was teaching at the time, and uh, about the time, just before I was one year old, he got an offer from the University of Redlands in California mm -hmm. to be the band director and the lower brass teacher there. So we moved to California before I was one. Yeah. So I, I really feel like a Californian more than a yeah. Wisconsin, but, you know, I, I love my cheese heads too. Yeah, who doesn't? So uh, so your your dad's a conductor and a college professor, and your mom's, you know, t you know teaching piano, and I'm, I'm sure you start playing orchestral or classical instruments in music. Well, the very first thing was, like, my mom taught piano at the house. Mm -hmm. So every afternoon, kids would come over and play yeah. piano. Yeah. So to me, that's just what kids do. Yeah. You know, every kid that I saw played piano. Mm -hmm. So my sister was two and a half years older than me, and usually you would start a kid on the piano in first grade. Mm -hmm. So when she was in first grade, she got started on piano lessons. So I, I was competitive. I'm like, all right. I just sat there and watched her play practice. And when she was done, I would go up at the piano and figure out, you know, by ear whatever her lessons were. So my mom decided she would start me on piano in another book so that I would also learn how to read music. Okay. Being a, a smart teacher like she was. Mm -hmm. So that's what I, I, you know, I played piano and I was also like playing like theme songs or TV shows that I liked by ear, you know, like The Addams Family or Batman or, you know, whatever yeah. at the time. And uh, then I would go to my dad's band concerts and football games and stuff like that. And um, so, I started getting interested in the other instruments. Uh, again, my sister started the flute when she was in fifth grade, which she does. You can choose a band instrument. Mm -hmm. Well, I was in third grade, and I wasn't going to be outdone. So I chose the second instrument to play, which is the clarinet, because I liked uh, the sound of in Peter and the Wolf. You know, the clarinet plays the cat. Part. Yes. So I, I yes. like that sound. It's and narrated by uh, Sterling Holloway. Sterling Holloway, I, I very have good. That, that was the first the first record that I was given as a kid, and, oh, okay. and I and I, I love that album. And I, I I had to find another copy of it off eBay, of course. And Fantastic. I and I, and I, I love that album. So well, that yeah. that's we got to listen to that if we were good. Yeah. You know, if we were good, we got to listen to that or Carnival of the Animals by Saint Song. Mm -hmm. So you know that so music was a thing that. It was very positive, you know? Yeah. It was like a treat. And yeah. so I started on the clarinet, and then uh, around that same time, I really got aware of the Beatles, because that was about 1964. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, I saw them on Ed Sullivan's show, and I had cousins that were older that were way, way into it. They got to go see the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl, and I was really jealous. Wow. And, but, you know, at first, I didn't think that I could play guitar or, or be cool like that at all. It was just like, you know, that's a thing that's from another universe. And then a couple of years later, I started, you know, getting interested in listening to radio, pop radio. And, of course, the Beatles were on there and, and the Monkees and the Birds and the Rolling Stones and all, all Buffalo Springfield eventually and Guess Who and all those kind of things. And I started wanting to play guitar. And my parents first thought, no. This is, he already plays the clarinet and already plays the piano. And I was practicing those like every day and taking lessons. So it was serious, you know. Yeah. And they thought another instrument, what, well, that's crazy. A kid that age can't play three instruments and still have a life. And, and they thought it would be a fad too. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a fad. I kept wanting and wanting it. And finally I started borrowing guitars from friends, you know. Mm -hmm. And when they realized that it wasn't going to go away, then... When I was 12, I got my first guitar for Christmas. And it was a St. George, uh, sort of a Jaguar copy. Yeah. You know, and I think it was like 2750 or something like that. And the Telecaster at that time, I remember Triangle White Telecaster. 
and thinking that was really easy to play, but that was like $75. Yeah. So <laughs> I got the St. George <laughs> and a little tiny Tysco Checkmate 66 amp. The 66 meant there was two six-inch speakers. Yes, which is all you need. <laughs> well, to, to crank out the bedroom, yeah. yeah. So uh, I just started learning, you know, listening to the radio and learning riffs and stuff and yeah. whatever I could. So what did your parents, how did your parents feel about this? You know, you, you know you've added this other instrument. Of course, they had concerns. And then, you know, it's like, are you going to keep up your practice with your other instruments? Well, that you? was the deal, so, yeah. supposedly. Yeah. I couldn't practice the guitar until after I'd practiced the piano and the clarinet. Yeah. And but the, since it was an electric guitar, yeah. I was just practicing with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I did, you know, I, it's not that I didn't like the piano or clarinet either. So I, I did keep up my studies on that and... and uh, the guitar, it, it's almost like guitar is my fun and that was my studies, in a way. So, how much were you practicing you know, between well, the three instruments? I mean, I was supposed to practice like a half hour a day on, on each thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I did that, but I did, you know, I did practice, yeah. you know, every day. And yeah. I, pretty soon I got tired of, of the piano, I think because I don't know. In hindsight, it might be with guitar, you, your two hands need to be really, really synchronized to be good, right? Piano, you, they need to have completely independent minds. And I was at that point where if I didn't get more independence with my hands, I wasn't going to get better. And so I got frustrated with it. And the other part was having my mom as my teacher. She would hear me practice all the time. And yell from upstairs, that's an F sharp. I'm like, <laughs> I'm practicing, leave me alone. <laughs> you know? So I eventually stopped playing the piano, and they were okay because the guitar had kind of taken over and it was a chordal instrument. And, yeah. you know, so. And I think by that time, I'd, I'd also started playing the bassoon and maybe the saxophone too. So there was always multiple instruments going on. Wow. So then you, I'm sure you played through a series of bands, and how did you end up in, uh, playing in Disneyland? Well, okay. yeah, my, the first band that I was in was a garage band up the street, and they already had three guitar players, so mm -hmm. I decided to play bass. Okay. You know? And uh, my first bass was a really cheap... I wanted a violin bass, you know, I wanted a Hofner. Yeah, like Paul. Yeah, exactly. But... I ended up with one that was sort of like the top part was like a violin, the bottom part had a weird cutaway. So it was sort of, it was made by Audition. Okay. I think it was $50 at the local grocery store. <laughs> pick up a head of lettuce. <laughs> yeah. Pick up a, a, yeah. a, 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 exactly. a base. Yeah. yeah. And an LP, you could get the albums yeah. there. And uh, I put, uh, f I bought some round wound or some, mm -hmm. uh, no, they were, black tape wound strings, mm -hmm. because that's what I'd seen on the Let It Be movie on Paul McCartney's bass. Yeah. Those strings were $30. The bass was $50. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were terrible. They were they didn't last. Like, they, the, the windings came loose, like, almost immediately. Wow. So they're bzz, 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 terrible. But anyway, um, the question was, how did I get to Disneyland? Um, yeah, I played in a whole bunch of different bands, you know, playing at frat parties. And the, since my dad taught at a college, I, I started playing in his college bands and ensembles when I was like 10 or 11. And what instruments are you playing in the... First was bass clarinet and then clarinet. And then in his jazz band, I would play guitar or bass. So I started, you know, I, would, I knew people college age. So I started playing with guys in college, probably... I don't know, they might have been seven, six, seven years older than me mm -hmm. you know, when I was pretty young. And that's kind of how I learned to improvise, too, because I'd learn a song like Badge or something like that, and, and I'd learn the solo, but I couldn't remember it when it came time to play it. So I'd just have to improvise. Right. And I was lucky to be in bands with guys who were really good. you know. And I guess I was, uh, I mean, I don't know, but I was probably kind of prodigious for my age. I didn't feel like it because I was always with people that were older and better than me, you know. So I was always striving to get, you know, up to that level. But that was really good for me because I didn't get an ego, and I was always pushing myself to get better. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so a lot of different bands, uh, you know, the the things I like playing was rock, you know, like the Who and 
the Stones, the Jay Giles Band, Santana, and anything, just rock, you know? Um, I liked everything else too, but that, that was what I, if I could make my own set list, it would be that kind of stuff. And uh, of course then I was in bands that played like proms and dances and stuff like that. And that was more in the era of R&B and so it was a lot of James Brown and Ohio Players and the Commodores and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And uh, in fact, I don't, Gerald Albright was in in a band with me then, and he's like very successful kind of uh, you know funk and and uh, smooth jazz artist now. Mm -hmm. And we used to play all of that stuff when we were kids. Uh, so eventually, I got a job at Disneyland as a it was like a summer job, and they they had two different acts that they would fill with college students. One was a sh marching show band kind of, mm -hmm. and the other was a, a stage group that was called the Kids of the Kingdom, eight singers, uh, no, 12 singers, six guys, six girls, and an eight-piece band, rhythm section, and four horns. So we'd play a show, you know, on a stage like four or five times a day, half-hour mm -hmm. show, and it would be like some hits of the day, like John Denver and the Carpenters and things like that, some Broadway kind of songs, some patriotic songs, yeah. whatever. And, uh, but I was getting paid to play electric guitar, you know, I had a weekly paycheck, and I remember buying stuff, you know, like the Carpenters song was Top of the World, which had pedal steel on it, which, you know, I wasn't gonna learn pedal steel yet, Yeah, but I, I bought an old Fender lap steel to try to emulate that sound, mm -hmm. you know, and at that store I found a, a Dan Electro electric sitar, you know, the, the, not the coral, but the small body Dano, which is yeah. very rare. Yes. And so I bought that too. Um, but that's kind of started my career at Disneyland. And I noticed that on, on one of the other stages, there was a stage that would rise out of the ground. And that would be more like a four or five, six piece rock band. And they would play six or seven sets a day, but stuff from the radio. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I want that job. Mm -hmm. I don't want to play a patriotic medley and, you know, a Broadway medley and stuff like yeah. that. I want to play, want to play rock, rock songs. Yeah. yeah. So th that sort of the, the bass player, the keyboard player, and one of the singers and myself of that Kids of the Kingdom band stayed together and got a local drummer and we kind of put together a little band and we got a gig uh, in Huntington Beach at the Huntington Harbor Yacht Club three nights a week they didn't have enough money for all of us, so we would rotate as to who wasn't there. <laughs> so one night it would be like piano, bass, singer, and drums. Next mm -hmm. would be guitar, bass, singer, and drums. You know, and, yeah. and, and it, it was like that. And then eventually we did, we auditioned for that job that we wanted at Disneyland, and we got that yeah. for a couple months. And we were pretty good, but not as good as bands that were a few years older, mm -hmm. you know. So we didn't keep it that long, but you know, we yeah. did it. And uh, that's while I was in college and I'd taken off a year. I started college early, graduated high school a semester early, started college a semester early, tested out of a lot of the first semester classes, music things, because I already knew ear training and sight singing and right. theory and all that kind of stuff. Because so I'd been to music camps and I'd been doing that stuff my whole life. Yeah. Um, but then with this band, I took a year off and, and tried to just go strictly playing, and it didn't work that great. So I decided to go back to college and finish college. And even during the rest of my college years, I did work a couple other different jobs at Disneyland. And the last one that I did there while I was in college was like a, a children's music education show, five half-hour shows a day, wearing a horrible costume, playing for school kids, third, you know, third to fifth graders. Right. It was, I hated it. And I thought, I'm never gonna work here again. I hate this, you know. Yeah. So I didn't for a year or two. And then uh, I just went with a friend of mine just to go, you know, to enjoy Disneyland one time. And I saw one of my friends was in a show there. So I went to backstage to say hello. And he said, hey, they've asked me to put together a group that could play Dixieland in bluegrass, they want somebody that can play cornet, lead instrument in Dixieland band, and fiddle, 
as lead instrument in a bluegrass band. You do, do you know anybody? I said, I don't think that person exists, but I can play mandolin and clarinet. Well, the mandolin was a lie because I, I didn't even own one, but I wanted yeah. to learn. Right. Clarinet was true, but I didn't know any Dixieland and didn't even like it. But I needed a job <laughs> at the time. And, and at that time, I had graduated from college with a music degree. Uh, I had been on a tour of Europe as a bassoonist with a, a chamber orchestra and choir. Uh, it was like two months. So that was great work for two months, but it was over. Mm -hmm. And I was in a, a new wave band at the time called Neo Paris and the Futures playing around like the Starwood, the Whiskey, uh, a lot of clubs in Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, that was like uh, Madame Wong's, Madame Wong's West, Hong Kong Cafe. It was a pretty thriving scene at that time. You know, the Knack was around, the motels, Oingo Boingo. 79, 80. And, exactly, yeah. exactly. And again, sort of guitar rock was sort of, you know, becoming a thing again instead yeah. of like more keyboard oriented or disco music. So... But we weren't making any money, and uh, you know it was kind of it was it was rough. So when this you know this opportunity came up, and he said, "Okay, you, you have the job." So I had to go out and buy a mandolin quickly, and start practicing. <laughs> and after about two months, uh, it was going to be a, a two month job. And you know we only knew like three songs of bluegrass three songs of dixieland and we'd play those and move to a different place and mm -hmm. and it, we got bored so we started learning more songs right and like the leader of the band was very entertaining he was, really was a comedian at heart but a talented musician dick hardwick was his name the banjo player doug maddox was he's actually one of the finest plectrum and tenor banjo players in the country and he could play five string at that time, just a few songs, but it sounded like he knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. you know. And the bass player was a tuba major, so he could play tuba and string bass. And you know, I was a trained musician, so I, I practiced a lot. So I, I caught on pretty quickly. And everybody was a little competitive for the audience's attention. So it was a good show. We were young. You know, we were all six feet tall, young, pretty good looking guys and, and competing, you know, for audience's attention. Yeah. So so both in your your uh, kind of stage banner, but also in your solos and such, because you're, you're oh, really yeah. trying to top each other. And oh, so yeah. Everyone's practicing. Everyone's coming up with some hot lick or something. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, some and shtick. The, the banjo player especially is so flashy and showy and all up and down the neck and just yeah. like, okay, how am I going to follow that? You know, and I was playing a yeah. soprano sax, I think, at the time and sometimes clarinet. And, uh, and I loved mandolin. I really loved it. You know, I had uh, discovered it the summer before. Uh, I had a scholarship to the Aspen Music Festival in Colorado. And that's a very, very prestigious classical program. But they were trying to add jazz to their curriculum. And a drummer that I'd played with in bands earlier uh, recommended me as the bass player. So they gave me a scholarship as a jazz bass player. I said, I'll take that if I can also be in the classical program as a bassoon player. Okay. Which they paid for my uh, my room and tuition, but not food. So I had to figure out a way to make some kind of money to you know eat. And so I answered an ad for it said wanted acoustic jazz bass player for immediate gigs. I'm like, immediate gigs? Yes. Mm -hmm. Acoustic bass? Yes, I could play that. So I, I checked out a bass from the from the uh, festival and went, and as it turns out, it was two local guys, a mandolin player and a guy playing flat top guitar, flat picking, and a fiddle player from the festival that were basically playing Grisman's first album. Okay. And I'd never heard that before, mm -hmm. and I liked it a lot. You know, so I heard it as a bass player, and I went, mm, I would like to be able to play that, what that guy's playing, mandolin. Yeah. So I really practiced a lot, and, and, and I kind of learned backwards, you know, kind of starting with Grisman, then learning, oh, Sam Bush, oh, then, you know, Ricky Skaggs, oh, Bill Monroe, oh, Jesse McReynolds, you know, oh, Bobby Osborne. So, <laughs> you know, almost backwards, but when I found Bill Monroe, I was like, wow, that's great. And Jesse yeah. McReynolds, Jesse is probably my favorite. The cross-picking. Yeah, so yeah. I started trying to learn that cross-picking, and... And, and just schooling myself in bluegrass in general, 
you know, I really loved it. Yeah. So, and, and through that, you know, discovered Clarence White as an acoustic guitar player. And, and also through all that, that's how I discovered Django Reinhardt. Because I thought, okay, this banjo stuff, what he was doing was Harry Reeser, who's a tenor banjo player, very, very good, and also Eddie Peabody, who's more plectrum, chordal style, but they're right. both very virtuosic, flashy, attention-getting. Mm -hmm. And so that I got interested in, in 20s and 30s guitar players like Eddie Lang and Dick McDonough and Carl Kress, which were great, but they were not kick-ass and flashy. Mm -hmm. And so I kept saying, there's got to be somebody, a guitar player that does this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. everybody would say, oh, you got to hear Django Reinhardt. You know, so I went and, you know, bought an LP of Django and went, oh, okay, this is what I want to hear on an acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Hendrix on the acoustic guitar. Yes. Exciting, all virtuosic, all over the place, swinging, emotional, you know, uh, technical. And it's, it, it, it sounded like nothing I'd ever heard before, you know? It didn't sound like Eddie Lang. It didn't sound like Doc Watson. It was this whole other world. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, in hindsight, I realized because everything about it is different. The pick is different. The strings are different. The guitar is different. The fingering is different. The chord shapes are different. Everything. And because, partially because Django is trying to emulate Louis Armstrong was a trumpet player. That was right. his idol. And so his phrasing, you know, it's, it's a guitarist attempt at Louis Armstrong. At phrasing. trumpet. Yeah. yeah. And he loved Duke Ellington. He loved the big bands. And here he was, just a guitar player, you know, with a violin and a couple other guitars and bass. And he's trying to cover big band trombone parts and horn stabs and all this other kind of stuff, doing however you can do it on the guitar. Yeah. So, and he only had you know, use of these two fingers. So he's doing this kind of fingering, you know, all kind of different chords and shapes and things up and down the neck and moving this way, not across like this, but up like this. So you get the whole range of the guitar, way more colorful, you know, a lot of different tone colors. So, you know, this is like going to school all over again from the beginning with a whole new vocabulary, technique, everything. And, and that started at Disneyland. So here I was there playing in the morning, three or four sets of bluegrass on the mandolin, learning, loving it. Uh, and then in the afternoon, playing three or four sets of Dixieland on the soprano sax or clarinet. N not loving it as much, you know, but still, it's, it's good music. And then discovering Django, so I was like, okay, my real instrument is guitar. How can I figure out a way to get paid to play guitar every day here? And so I talked them into letting us create even a third entity because we would have different costumes and play in different areas. So if there was a third entity, uh, I could play the guitar and we would play kind of Django music and Nat King Cole trio, the Boswell sisters, like entertaining jazz vocals and, and instrumentals. Right. We'd wear 30s style outfits and we could play in a different place in the park. So they like that. It looks like there's more different things going on. Mm -hmm. I got to play guitar. And so that's really how I started playing gypsy jazz. So you're you're playing all these different styles of music and such in your work. So you're practicing a lot. Yeah, a lot of practicing. Um, and, and really getting the chance to sort of earn as you learn. Mm -hmm. You know, Disneyland was a great place for that. Was, and, and also how to entertain. Because there, people were walking by and they didn't come to hear music. They yeah. came to see the characters or ride on rides and do that. Yeah. So if you could grab their attention and hold it for one song, great. Two songs, oh, amazing. Yeah. If you could create a little set, oh, fantastic. You know, because like in the summertime, if you could get a crowd, you know, and get them really into your stuff, that was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot about performing and holding people's attention and stuff like that. And, you know, during those times, you could practice during the breaks a lot. And then at the end of the day, like every day, I would play these three different styles of music on three different instruments. And then in the night, I would go up to Hollywood and I would play in rockabilly bands and in rock bands and in country bands and... You know, so I was meeting a lot of people, 
Yeah. Um, and I went to a bluegrass festival and met Bill Bryson and really liked him. And it just so happened that our bass player quite a bit would had some health issues. So Bill would come in and, and sub for us. So we ended up playing with him a lot, you yeah. know, and singing with him. And, and of course, uh, he has an iconic song called Riding on the L&N. And yes. we had learned that. It was one of the first songs we'd learned. So, you know, and here, of course, he played with Country Gazette with Roland White, and he played uh, with the Bluegrass Cardinals and played with Byron Berline, you know. So to me, he was kind of like, mm, this is a, this is a... Uh, He's kind of played with the, the California Bluegrass royalty. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so at the time, he started playing with Chris Hillman. And Chris had a band that was including himself on mandolin and guitar, Al Perkins on dobro, mm -hmm. Jerry Sheff on bass, and Bertie Ledden on banjo and guitar. Well... Jerry Sheff was the first to leave, and Bill Bryson took his place. Okay. So this is in 1984, somewhere like that. And I had already started a band at that time called the Cheatin' Hearts. I would met a girl named Kitra. Uh, her name is Kitra Moore. Now okay. she's married to Bob Moore. Yeah, the, a famous uh, A-team bassist. Nashville. Yeah. yeah. She hadn't met him yet at that time. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah, interesting. I'll try to make it not too complicated, but she had a rockabilly band at the time, and I was I had, I had a rockabilly band as well called the Shaken Snakes, and the guitar I was playing bass in that band, upright bass. Mm -hmm. The guitar player in the band was named Jeff Ross. He was slated to substitute for her. In her band, she had Johnny Meeks, who was one of the original <laughs> Blue Caps. Yeah, Gene yeah. Vincent's Blue Caps. Yes. Yeah. Well, he couldn't make the gig, so Jeff was coming into play. Well, he couldn't do it, so he passed it on to me. So here I'm subbing two down the road. Mm -hmm. And I'm playing with Kitra, and we're doing rockabilly songs, and it's nice. And the drummer is fantastic. You know, I was like, wow, this guy has such a great pocket and a great feel. And so just a slight detour earlier, that, that first summer I worked at Disneyland, um, one of my friends said, hey, I've got passes to Knott's Bray Farm. Let's go over there. And we were always looking for free things to do. He said, Rick Nelson's playing. I'm like, okay. You know, I, I remember him from Ozzy and Harriet. And, mm -hmm. I, and Garden Party was on the radio. So I wasn't a major fan, but, you know, it's a music show. Come on. Yeah. So I went with him to see Rick Nelson and was ear level with Tom Brumley's amp. Mm -hmm. And I'd never heard pedal steel like that in my face. And I absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. And I decided... And he said, you want to meet Rick Nelson? I said, not that much, but I want to meet that guy on the yeah. pedal steel. Yeah. So we went backstage and I met Tom, very nice man. And I said, where can I find a pedal steel? And he told me about a shop, Blackie Taylor's music. Mm -hmm. And so I went there and I traded a, a Fender Dual Showman amp that I had for a student steel and started to try to learn to play pedal steel. So I really loved Rick Nelson's country rock, Stone Canyon Band. That was a thing. You know, and I went to see them a number of times when they yeah. played in the area. Um, years later, I become friends with Dennis Larden, who is now his name is Denny Sorokin, but at the time he was going as Dennis Larden. He was the lead guitar player and wrote a lot of songs for Rick Nelson okay. at that time. He lives now in Nashville. He said songs got by Crosby, Stills, Nash. A lot of songs by Rick Nelson, obviously. And he was also in Every Mother's Son, which did come on down to my boat. So anyway, a side story. Um, so anyway, I'd, I'd seen Rick Nelson a number of times. I'm at this gig with Kitra. In the break, I go up to the drummer. And I said, man, you, you sound amazing. Where did you come from? How come I've never met you before? He said, well, I, I used to play with Rick Nelson. I went, I look back at his kit, which was a really bedraggled kick drum that looked like it had been thrown down the stairs. Uh, a chrome snare and a rototom, you know, no other toms or anything. I'm like, well, I I said, did you used to have a set of those drums, double kick, bunch of toms, walnut finish? He said, yeah. I said, I saw you one of your first gigs with Rick Nelson, because I it, it stood out to me like, why yeah. does a country drummer have all of these drums? Right. Well, he just got in a big gig. He got an endorsement with Slinger Lips. Yeah. And so you got to bring boom. all the stuff. Yeah. So I said, okay, yeah. I, I, I've seen you before. You're yeah. amazing. So that yeah. was Steve Duncan. Yeah. So that's how I met Steve. Okay. And 
And Kitra and I decided to put together a band. She she liked country. Mm -hmm. I, I and I had seen recently seen Ricky Skaggs and the Whites do a concert at the Greek Theater, and I thought, okay, this is combining some bluegrass, some rockabilly, some country harmonies, picking all these things that I like. Let's let's make a band like this. Yeah. So, and this is when Ricky's doing you know full band uh, electric things with Ray Flack playing guitar. Yep, and, Ray and, Flack was okay. still in the band, and okay. Bruce Bouton and. Yes. Um, Jesse, who's the bass player? Chambers. Yes, Jesse yeah. Chambers, and maybe George Grantham. Yeah, from I Poco. Think. Yeah, playing drums. I think so. Yeah. And then, and the Whites, you know, of course, were yeah. great, you know, doing their hits like Hanging Around and Needles and Pins and stuff yeah. like that. So that made an impression on me because they were both so good. And of course, I knew Ricky from Bluegrass too, you know, and I liked his records. Yeah. So met Kitra. I said, let's put together a band. Uh, I had another friend of mine named Bob Knight who was an acoustic guitarist and singer. So now we have a front line. I was playing electric guitar, and three of us sang. Bill Bryson was on bass. Steve Duncan was on drums. Mm -hmm. And Kitra knew Sneaky Pete. From the Burrito Brothers. Yeah. yeah. So we had Sneaky Pete as a pedal yeah. steel player. So a lot of ties to a lot of other different things, to the yeah. Flying Burrito Brothers and... Rick Nelson and on and on. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, uh, you know, we had some material, we wrote some things, we did some traditional things, and, and we played around, and I, I kind of realized now we we're probably a little bit too progressive for what was going on, but it was still, you know, Kitra had a vibe on stage, we had really good harmonies, there was good playing, uh, our songs were developing, um, but you know we were pretty green as far as the business goes, and right around that same time, January 1985 um, is one of those moments. I can look back at certain moments of my career where, okay, this is where all a lot of things came together, and then a new chapter started, and uh, you know sometimes people wonder about. Uh, luck, you know, and being in the right place at the right time and, you know, timing and those kind of things with a career. Well, all of those things do play a big part. You know, you, you do have to be in the right place at the right time. Otherwise, you don't meet that person or yeah. whatever. But if you're not ready, if you're not ready for what might happen, then you yeah. get left by the wayside. Yeah. So yeah, so many so many people think you know there's just luck involved, but they don't realize how much work is also involved. So, like the amount of practice that you put in, you know, the, you know, of playing those different, you know, learning, you know, learning harmonies, learning those different instruments, learning all those parts, and then you know, and then being ready for when these opportunities, when the luck comes in, you've got to be ready. Yeah, that's yeah. that's exactly right, uh, and and you have to be able to see the opportunity too, and yeah. see what you might be able to bring to the table, yeah. you know, without overwhelming <laughs> the opportunity, yeah. you know? Um, so, it, it, yeah, there's, a, there's so many different factors involved. Um, so, but you had Jan January of, of 19... January 1985, uh, the NAM show, if, if people don't know, uh, it's where musical instrument manufacturers bring their latest things and they try to get stores to order them, basically. Mm -hmm. So I'd been going to those since I was 10, probably, with my dad. And he would go there to buy band music and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I remember at that, you know, early on, it was like one ballroom. There was only three places where you could look at guitars. Fender, Gibson, and Rickenbacker, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, you know, now it's, it's massive. Yeah, it's huge. Massive. Yeah. Well, so here's where something comes together. So David Grisman had made a deal with a company called Saga, and they were going to make a replica of his Monteleone mandolin, mm -hmm. call it a dog model, D-A-W-G, a nickname. For his, his music and his nickname. Yeah. So uh, he he's there at their booth with his mandolin, and he's trying to attract attention so people will come and order this instrument, right? Well, meanwhile, you know, I love his music. You know, he's what kind of sent me down the road to eventually play bluegrass. And 
I know that he also loves Django Reinhardt because his original concept kind of was to take that gypsy jazz and bluegrass and create a hybrid. Mm -hmm. So I'm there with a, a gypsy jazz guitar and he's there probably bored, you know, and there happens to be a bass player there who I wish I knew who it was. I, I don't, I, I don't know the guy's name, but I said, you know, would you like to jam? Of course, you know, yeah. <laughs> so we play Limehouse Blues and we play Sweet Georgia Brown and, you know, again, so I knew this stuff already, you mm -hmm. know, so the preparation was there. I knew who he was and I liked his music. While we were jamming, up walks Chris Hillman and Al Perkins. So I get instant credibility. Little does yeah. he know, I've known this guy for seconds, right? Mm -hmm. But here I am jamming with David Grisman yeah. and holding my own, you know? So Chris, uh, Bill Bryson was playing with him at the time. Bill had already told him about me. So he'd heard my name. Now he sees me jamming with Grisman. And at that time, Bernie Ledden had just left his quartet. So there was an open spot. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't play banjo, which Bernie had played, but it was okay. I, you know, he, I played mandolin and I played guitar. And so the two of us would swap back and forth on those instruments. And the first, that first quartet was, was Chris, Al Perkins on Doro, Bill Bryson on bass, and myself on mandolin and guitar. So, th you know, that... That was like a nucleus of all of these different things that I'd been preparing for. And so we did a couple of tours like that. And Chris had some material at the time, a song called One Step Forward, a song called Love Reunited. Um, we were doing some traditional bluegrass material and, and a lot of his songs, some from the Burrito Brothers, some from his solo albums. Um, but these new songs he was bringing in you know, I thought, these don't, they sound like they need something more than an acoustic band. You know, that this sounds like, it sounds more like country rock, you know? Yeah. And, and he kind of wanted to shy away from that. He'd been in so many bands by that time. You know, The Birds, The Flying Burrito Brothers, Manassas, yeah. uh, Souther Hillman Fure, McGuinn Clark Hillman, McGuinn Hillman. Yeah. He'd gotten a little burned from those. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, some successful, some not, and all, you know, people in the record business it's it can be rough yeah. you know it can be hard on your ego and but so he was a little reticent to oh, not another band thing you know so what i did is i took a couple of those songs and i made demos and and my what the sound i heard in my head was the pretenders mm -hmm. electric guitar kind of sounds british rock guitar sounds with bluegrass harmonies so I, I did a demo of Love Reunited. I did a demo of a song called Leave This Town using six string bass. Uh, and I did one called uh, Midnight Heart, which we never released. But, so he heard these demos and went, oh, okay, I see where you're going with this thing. And that kind of softened him a little bit to the idea. And meantime, we got uh, asked to back up Dan Fogelberg and open for him on a tour that summer. And Chris really wanted the vocal power of her Peterson more than, uh, than Al at that time. And I could play Dobro too, so I could kind of fill in the Dobro parts and then he would have better vocals from mm -hmm. Herb. So now you've got Chris, Herb, Bill, and myself. And, and an already good, what I thought was an already good band was now even better. You know, because then you had also banjo and um, so and, and Herb had probably secretly always wanted to do sort of a, a Buck Owens and Don Rich kind of duet thing with Chris. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of up for it, too. So I knew that Steve Duncan and J.D. Manus were the right guys, you know, because more because J.D., you know, he was a star. He had a name and come on, you want more power, you know. And Steve, I just knew from his playing and his feel. But I was the young kid, so they didn't really listen to me at first. Uh, we tried a couple other guys, and it didn't work. And, and the second gig with those, I, I, in the break, I was walking up to Chris to say, you know, 
if you like this and this is working for you, please be my guest. Have it, you know, but I, I, I'm not happy. I don't want to be part of it. Well, before I even got that out of my mouth, he said, this isn't working, is it? I said, no, it's not. And I know the guys that will make it work. So he's like, okay. So we, by the time we did like maybe the second gig with the full lineup, we got signed. We got uh, Curb Records was there and they saw us at the Palomino and they signed us. And so that, the cool thing was that the idea that I heard in my head, it, it was realized and country radio really liked that sound. They could tell that we had a lot of respect for bluegrass and traditional country, but it also had a, a, a little bit of a rock edge too, yeah. you know, and it didn't sound like what was on the radio. At that time, a lot of people were using Strat through a, a rack and a, maybe a PV amp or something like that or direct. Yes. And I was all about vintage Vox amps and, you know, vintage guitars, Rickenbacker, 12 string, Dan Electra, six string bass, Telecaster, Gretsch, all of that kind of stuff. So when I came uh, to do our first album, Ed C was the engineer and I rolled in an AC30. And he said, is that a vintage Vox AC30? Yeah. I said, yeah. He said, great, I've always wanted to record one of those. So I had an ally right away mm -hmm. and, and and Ed was amazing with the guitar sense. And he really, really, he spent a lot of time miking up things in a particular way and moving the mic an inch and all yeah. this kind of stuff. So I would do even some of the most simple parts and I would come in the studio and it would sound like notes were coming out of different places. If I, was, and I wasn't even using a stereo effect or anything. So he was a, a great ally and, and that uh, the success of the Desert Rose Band, uh, of course, brought me from a local musician in California to a national and international musician. Yeah. And uh, Paul Worley being one of the producers, he also then started using me as a session musician to bring those sounds to other artists. Right. And so again, it's, it's sort of luck, you know, like someone would say, how do I get into doing sessions? I don't know. You know, it's like you, you put together a band and it has some hits and then, <laughs> and then people like you're playing and they want to use you on other things. Right. Um, but I sort of like instantly was part of an A team and it was intimidating at first, you know, because I was with guys that, that I'd seen their names on records forever. And who's this kid, you know, from California in the lead guitar player chair. But they were very, very nice. Uh, the first sessions I did was for Gene Watson, and it, it went great. And, and eventually, you know, I did them for a lot for Pam Tillis and Hank Jr. and you name it, you know, Marty Stewart and, all, all, you know, Willie Nelson and all, all kind of different artists over the years. But again, it was like I was ready for it, you know, but it wasn't something I necessarily tried to do. It just kind of happened, and... You were ready. Yeah, and I'd spent a lot of time at home with my own... You know, I started doing home recording back with... It was a TX 3340, 4-track, mm -hmm. you know? So I knew how to bounce stuff and how to mix stuff and how to play stuff and how to, you know, fill up tracks and be economical and play with a click and all, you know, be in tune and all of these things that you need to do to be a good session musician. Yeah. And, you know, recording yourself, that's where you really hear, oh, wow, I'm playing too much here. This is not working. If you have a musical sensibility, exactly. you're able to hear those things. Yeah. And I would, you know, I would arrange and play in a way like I knew what I wanted to add to this next song. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't overplay. Yeah. So then when I'm with other guys, you know, I, I, I use that same sense, you know, arrangement sense. And the arrangement things I learned from deconstructing the Beach Boys records and the Beatles records and whatever record I liked, you know, the sound of it, I would try to figure out, you know, not only what kind of guitar it was, what the pickups were, what amp it was, what microphone, what effects, how do they stack the vocal? And, you know, I remember when I first learned about doubling, you know, I tried to get my guitar to sound like the Beatles guitars. And I knew I was playing the same notes, but it didn't sound the same, you know? And then I finally realized, 
Oh, okay. And then I tried to have an effect. You know, when I remember the first MXR flanger when that came out. I thought, that's going to give me that sound. Well, kind of, but not really. I mean, it's, it's the, the imperfection is what makes it a right. double. And you yeah. can't do that with a machine. Yeah. You know, there's things that are close.